Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Tuesday, everybody. Yesterday, Monday, the U.S. and U.K. unveiled sweeping measures against hackers backed by China's government, alleging they carried out extensive cyber attacks against targets across Washington and Westminster, placed malware in. America's electrical grids, defense systems, and other critical infrastructure, and stole voting rolls for 40 million British citizens. The U.S. Department of Justice on Monday indicted seven Chinese nationals who it said were members of APT31, a Wuhan-based hacking group run by China's main spy service. The indictment says that the group sent more than 10,000 malicious emails with hidden tracking links to officials across the federal government, businesses of national economic importance, including Defence and Capitol Hill. The UK sanctions announced on Monday include an asset freeze and travel ban on two members of APT31, who the Foreign Office said were quote operating on behalf of the Chinese Ministry of State Security, end quote, and who had been involved in the cyber espionage campaign. Taken together, the actions on both sides of the Atlantic underscored the escalation of cyber conflict between the Anglophone allies and Beijing. This all follows an executive order signed by President Biden last month to defend U.S. ports from Chinese cyber attacks, and FBI Director Christopher Wray expressing that the U.S. has become more laser focused on China's cyber threat. American intelligence agencies have also warned that the malware found in U.S. infrastructure appeared to be intended for use if the United States were coming to the aid of Taiwan. The UK said the Chinese hackers were behind two cyber campaigns on Britain's elections watchdog and parliamentarians. UK-based The Financial Times writes that quote the interventions by the US and UK come against a backdrop of geopolitical and trade tensions with Beijing, with Prime Minister Sunak warning on Monday that an increasingly assertive China was an epoch-defining challenge. End quote. U.S.-based The New York Times writes that quote, the United States is coordinating with Britain, Canada, Australia, and other allies to confront China's hacking, fearing that the rising tempo of activity has received comparatively little attention. End quote. Authorities in New Zealand have also accused China of targeting its parliamentary network in 2021. Australia, on the other hand, said its electoral system had not been compromised in the cyber campaigns targeting the UK, but expressed concern over what they called the persistent targeting of democratic institutions and processes. UK Foreign Secretary, former Prime Minister Lord David Cameron, expressed today that it was quote, completely unacceptable that China state-affiliated organisations and individuals have targeted our democratic institutions and political processes. End quote. The Chinese embassy in London soon after expressed, quote, "The so-called cyber attacks by China against the UK are completely fabricated and malicious slanders. We strongly oppose such accusations." End quote. And in Beijing, China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs spokesperson dismissed the hacking reports as fake news. Next up, last week, China's top diplomat Wang Yi made trips to New Zealand and Australia. It's important that we take note of some of the salient statements and developments from the trip. China and Australia held the seventh foreign and strategic dialogue, during which time Wang Yi stated that China was ready to work with Australia to further prepare for high-level exchanges between the two countries and restart consultation and dialogue mechanisms. Wang Yi said that Australia-China relations are comprehensive and that the two countries should be partners rather than rivals. Wang met with Australia's leader of the opposition to expressing quote the development of China-Australia relations is the result of joint efforts of all political parties in Australia. End quote. The two sides could not reach an agreement on removing all trade barriers on Australian goods, but announced that Premier Li Qiang would be planning a visit to Canberra in the near future. During this trip, Australia's most senior police chief also landed in Beijing to seal a raft of significant deals with Chinese security officials for tackling drugs and transnational crime. The Australian Federal Police Commissioner said the Beijing visit enhances crime-fighting arrangements to dismantle drug cartels targeting the Asia-Pacific region. We have seen that relations between Australia and China have greatly improved since their low point in 2020. 
After China's initial strategy of punishing Australia proved ineffective, it looks like Beijing's new approach is to use the carrot of trade and market access to pull Canberra out of America's China containment strategy. Beijing employs rhetorical devices similar to what we have seen in China-EU exchanges too. Wang Yi during this trip, for example, urged Australia to avoid a third-party disruption of their relationship, to follow their own interests, and to be independent in foreign policy. This is very unlikely to work, however. Australia's core foreign policy since the rise of the Empire of Japan has been to work with an external security guarantor, first the UK, then the US, to prevent the emergence of a hegemon in Asia. Analysts in North America and Europe often forget that Australia was almost invaded by the Japanese in World War II. This memory has remained in the minds of Australian foreign policy makers ever since. The US and Australia are very close interest civilizational allies, whereas culturally, politically and linguistically there is a gulf of difference between Australia and China. And of course, over the last decade, the Australian public went from having some of the highest levels of positive sentiment towards China to the highest levels of negative sentiment. As such, Australia will continue to stand close to the US, the UK and the wider Western alliance while trying to ensure as much China market access as possible without undermining the former security position. Meanwhile, Wang Yi also visited New Zealand. Minister of Foreign Affairs Winston Peters, after his meeting with Wang, expressed, quote, Our discussions were wide-ranging. Alongside areas of cooperation, it was important to acknowledge areas of difference, such as human rights, including the situation in Xinjiang, Hong Kong and Tibet, end quote. Adding, quote, New Zealand follows developments in the Pacific closely and emphasizes the importance of engaging through existing regional institutions and arrangements, in particular on regional security matters. We also highlighted New Zealand and China's shared interest in a secure and prosperous Indo-Pacific region and raised concerns over increased tensions in the South China Sea and Taiwan Strait. End quote. Next up, and finally for today, we move to the Chinese economy. But just quickly, if you're enjoying today's episode, as always, it's a huge help if you can hit the like and subscribe buttons. This is the only way in which the channel can grow on the platform. Patreon and Buy Me a Coffee links are also in the description for those who want to help keep the channel financially sustainable. Thank you so much, everybody, for the ongoing support. According to a new Bloomberg Economics report published yesterday, Monday, China's high technology sector is driving an increasing amount of demand for goods and services and its contribution could rival real estate by 2026. The report, authored by economists Chang Shu and Eric Zhu, argues, quote, The high technology sector has potential to become a more significant source of growth. It's estimated to drive demand with nearly 19% of GDP by 2026, up from 14.3% last year, and almost on par with the property sector now, end quote. Bloomberg economics analysts looked at sectors involving medicine, advanced equipment, IT, communications equipment and services, as well as research and development. It estimates that the final demand related to high tech was 18 trillion yuan to 2.5 trillion US dollars in 2023, about 14.3% of GDP. That's less than property, which drove demand worth 20.1% of GDP. The report argues that with the property sector forecast to continue shrinking in the coming years, The fast growth of high technology industries and their increasing economic weight make them a promising growth engine. Not all are convinced that this technology sector will save the economy, however. Peking University Professor of Finance Michael Pettis expressed today that Bloomberg Economics, quote, may be making the same mistake analysts made in 2022 through 2023, end quote. We end today's video with his comments on this report, which he published today which we, quote, selected excerpts from directly. When we first saw China switch investment out of the property sector and into manufacturing after the 2021 clampdown on the property sector, many analysts argued that this was the solution to China's over-reliance on non-productive investment to drive the economy. But there's nothing intrinsically productive or non-productive about either. Building excess capacity in manufacturing is as unsustainable as building empty apartment buildings. What matters is not whether the investment is in a sexy sector, but whether the total economic value created exceeds the total economic cost of that investment, including subsidies. In a few years, we may very well discover the surge in high technology investment created an epoch-making technological breakthrough that was both value-creating and sustainable. But while this is possible, it is also unlikely. 
a surge in investment in frontier technology can be just as unsustainable as investment in property, as the USSR proved in the 1960s, especially if the surge was driven by the need to find a new growth engine. If this new investment in technology is justified, why did it take a collapse in the property sector for Chinese businesses to discover the opportunity? After all, they have long had access to as many resources and as much capital as they needed. I'm not arguing that China isn't better off shifting investment from property to high technology industries. It probably is. But unless that shift is driven by real demand and real value creation, net of all subsidies, it cannot be a sustainable source of growth. China's high investment strategy made a lot of sense when China was severely underinvested. Since then, however, it has been trying urgently to find new areas of underinvestment. But as Brazil, the USSR, Japan, and many others showed, these aren't always there. Every historical precedent suggests that China will only be able to regain sustainable growth by rebalancing domestic demand from investment to consumption. The transition will be difficult, but ultimately, it is the only thing that seems to work. Here ends the direct quote and today's episode of China Update. Let me know what you think about the Bloomberg Economics Report, as well as Pettis's response in the comments below. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching today's episode. Have a lovely Tuesday, and I will see you all tomorrow.